Konzentrationslager Auschwitz, the Auschwitz Concentration Camp, was created at the beginning of the Second World War. It existed from 1940 to 1945 and was the largest of all German places of torture and extermination. The first prisoners there were Polish. As of 1941, citizens from other occupied countries of Europe were incarcerated here. A year later, it became the center of the mass murder of Jews. Arbeit macht frei. Work makes you free. A cynical, inhuman, mocking slogan. No one was ever made free through work in the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camps, only through death and death alone. The great majority of those who died in Auschwitz were murdered in the gas chambers, although some found their death in the barracks and elsewhere. Death came by being shot, by an injection of phenol, by starvation, by being beaten to death. Many were the ways of dying here. Was es uns gelang, dem deutschen Volk eine neue Idee zu geben und dieses Volk in diese Idee... We succeeded in giving the German nation a new idea, announced Adolf Hitler when he had taken over the rule of Germany in January 1933. The idea of ruling over other nations, of destroying other nations and peoples. Such was the program inherent in the Führer's Mein Kampf, though he never put it in so many words. Germans awake was Hitler's call and they did awake. They awoke to stand in the disciplined ranks of the SA and SS, Hitler Jugend, and the Arbeitsfront. Parades, cheering masses, Sieg Heil, torchlight parades, everything in the best Nazi style. The Nazi new order was born, and with it the attempt to rule the world. The world refused to listen. Little was said also about the first concentration camps, though the opponents of the new regime were imprisoned there as of 1933. The books of liberals, socialists and Jews burned on bonfires in German university campuses. The wisest words pronounced in the name of the German people went up in flames. The Nazis did not need them, for they were different. To be different was a crime for which the Nazis delivered the death sentence. The Germans wanted living space, Lebensraum, without Jews and Slavs, stay out of Jewish shops, refuse treatment by Jewish doctors and advice by Jewish lawyers, refuse to work in a Jewish workplace and don't employ Jews, don't associate with Jews.
protect German blood and German honor. The 15th of September 1935, the Nuremberg Laws, license to kill. The persecution of 1936 and 37, the escalation of 1938, constrain, humiliate, then eliminate. That script would be implemented many a time in the future. Synagogues were burning in Munich and Nuremberg. In the crystal night of the 9th and 10th of November, 1938, the windows of Jewish homes and shops were destroyed all over Germany. Their contents put to the torch. 20,000 Jews were imprisoned during the pogrom. Hundreds were wounded and killed. 7,500 shops were demolished and looted. As of the 13th of March, 1938, Hitler ruled over Austria, annexed to the Reich. He reached for the Sudetenland, with the Western powers agreeing to the partial partitioning of Czechoslovakia. It was called Saving Peace in Europe. Hitler's joy knew no bounds. Almost exactly on the anniversary of Austria's annexation, Hitler marched into Prague. Who would be next? to be Poland. The Germans moved into Poland in the early morning of the 1st of September 1939 and waited for their ally, the Soviet Union, to do the same. On the 17th of September, the Russians entered Poland and, following the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact concerning the boundary of German-Russian interests in Poland, halted along the line of the rivers Bug and San. Warsaw capitulated on the 27th of September. A few days later, Hitler celebrated victory. Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, France, Yugoslavia and Greece were to go the same way as conquered Poland. Rommel's Africa Corps fought in Africa to support Mussolini. Hitler abandoned his eastern ally and attacked the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941. He didn't realize this was an act of suicide. Drunken with victories in Europe, he moved further and further to the east. All supply lines for the 200 German divisions fighting in Russia led through occupied Poland. The Germans therefore had to ensure that they had total control in Poland, and so they introduced there the most horrific terror. Hitler had promised those territories would be depopulated and then settled by Germans. The German people had to be freed from Poles, Russians, Jews and Gypsies, pronounced Nazi Justice Minister Otto Thirak, hence the spiraling terror in all its forms. If you did not die immediately, you were sent to a camp. The largest was Auschwitz. In the south of Poland, there was a small town called Oświęcim. The Germans incorporated it into the Third Reich and called it Auschwitz. The Auschwitz concentration camp was organized in the town's former army barracks.
It was in late April 1940 when a specialist in such matters, Rudolf Hess, a senior official of the Sachsenhausen concentration camp and several SS men, arrived in the deserted barracks. The history of the largest cemetery of victims of man's hate to his fellow men started with him. Hess was posted commander of Auschwitz. The first transport to arrive was composed of 728 Poles from Tarnow prison, sentenced to Auschwitz for enmity towards the Germans for participation in the resistance movement, helping Jews, whispering propaganda, for sabotage and refusing to labor for the Great Reich. On arrival, they were deprived of names and given numbers. From then on, they were to become only ranks of numbers on SS files, a striped camp uniform, shaven head, and a number tattooed on the arm. That was to be a typical camp inmate. The camp Gestapo was scrupulous in registering the Auschwitz prisoners, hence our accurate knowledge about them. Before the Nazis began what they called the final solution of the Jewish question, Poles, Czechs, Russians, Austrians, Yugoslavs, French, German and Jews from many countries arrived there as political prisoners. of numbers grew in the camp register. Columns of prisoners swelled on the camp parade ground. The density of prisoners in the barracks exceeded even the official limits specified by German regulations governing the treatment of second-class races. The camp had to be enlarged and the area surrounded by a high-voltage barbed wire had to be extended. The number of Auschwitz camps had to be increased and a whole network of sub-camps created. Auschwitz was not just an ordinary camp but became a whole complex factory to annihilate people through labor, drive them to work, beat them, and kill them. In 1940 and early 41, most Poles living near the area of the camp were evacuated. Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler then ordered the construction of the second Auschwitz camp, three kilometers away at Birkenau. Thousands of prisoners sent here to be tormented as well as prisoners of war from routed Soviet divisions built it. All were deprived of any rights, including the right to live. There was Auschwitz, then Auschwitz-Birkenau, and now Auschwitz-Monowitz, the third camp in the death factory. Altogether, there were 40 sub-camps located nearby in Upper Silesia at the factories producing for the front, Führer, and Fatherland. The Auschwitz slaves were forced under pain of death to build the military might of their oppressors. Reichsführer Himmler regularly visited the camps and building sites. The SS sold the labor of their slaves to earn enormous sums. The big concerns and companies, IG Farben, Union, Siemens, Hermann Göring Werke, and others also made fortunes. An IG Farben official termed his company's cooperation with the SS a new friendship which has come as a blessing. Though it was almost exhausting, Himmler seemed to be pleased with himself and his subordinates. The SS camp staff faced a fresh, unprecedented task. Adolf Hitler had ordered the final solution of the Jewish question, which he had promised the nation ten years before. The Auschwitz camp commander Hirsch quoted Himmler in his memoirs. The Führer ordered that it was us, the SS, who were to carry out that order. The places of annihilation in the East cannot cope with campaigns of such scope, and so I have designated Auschwitz to carry it out. Speaking to a conference in Wannsee in Berlin on the 20th of January 1942, 
Reinhard Heydrich told senior Third Reich officials that the right time had come to exterminate the rest of the 11 million Jews from all over Europe, mainly from Poland and the Soviet Union, but also from other countries not yet under German occupation. The Jews were herded into ghettos, degraded by the brutal way they were treated and by their living conditions. Nazi legislation in German-occupied Poland, and also in land incorporated into Germany, had implemented the ideas of the Nuremberg laws from the outset, and the desire of Mein Kampf's author to put paid finally to world Jewry. The Jews were systematically singled out when conquered nations were being pacified, settled in separate districts and towns, marked with the Star of David, had all contacts with the rest of the local population ruptured. Death sentences were passed on all on both sides who tried to break out of that isolation. Hanging and shooting was the penalty for leaving the ghetto as was every gesture of material solidarity and assistance on the Aryan side of the walls. Every tenth Polish citizen, every third resident of Warsaw was a Jew. Half a million Jews were herded into the Warsaw ghetto by the Germans. Hans Frank, the general administrator of German-occupied Poland, a doctor of law promoted to his post by the Nazi administration, told his subordinates, the Jewish race is to be totally destroyed. The ghettos in Poland, Belarusia, the Ukraine, and Russia, also in Lithuania, became the final stations on what the Germans called the road to heaven. It led through a hell on earth. In the East, the Nazis acted without scruples and constraint, for this land was to be theirs in any case. In Western Europe, however, appearances had to be kept up. The Theresienstadt town ghetto in Czechoslovakia was an example of pretense and deceit. The intention was to display German humanitarianism and respect for law and order. But German law and order resulted in most of those held in Theresienstadt being transported to Auschwitz. Heinrich Himmler was a cold-blooded, calculating and systematic bureaucrat. He had received an order to eliminate the Jews and tackled it in a scientific manner. Auschwitz was the optimum choice for the center to undertake the final settlement of the Jews. It was near the ghettos and labor camps for Jews in the East. Communication was easy with the rest of the Reich. Industry requiring labor was on the spot while it was simple to conceal the crematorium chimneys amongst the local factories, mines and foundries. The first experiment with gas was as early as September 1941. 600 Soviet prisoners of war and 250 Poles from the sick room were gassed with Cyclone B in the cellars of Block 11. Auschwitz commander Hess noted that this experiment quietened him down because after all I was on the threshold of mass killing the Jews and neither I nor Eichmann had any idea how such mass killing should be tackled. Now we had found gas and the manner of procedure, he wrote. This calming of his nerves came before the Van Zee conference. He was fully aware that the Jews would have to be mass murdered sooner or later. Gassing trials continued in 1941 in a building which had been used since 1940 to cremate the corpses of those who had been shot, hung and murdered in other ways. The largest room in this building was the mortuary, converted into a temporary and experimental gas chamber by boring four holes in the ceiling through which the gas was introduced. The idea of installing imitation showers came later.
The furnaces were installed by a respectable family company, Topf und Sohne of Erfurt. Topf and his sons went on to construct crematoria furnaces in Birkenau and other camps. The gas chamber and crematorium one furnaces proved insufficient when the mass transports of Aktion Reinhardt started arriving in Auschwitz in the first months of 1942. The campaign geared to robbing, using and then killing Jews. Further gas chambers called the Red and the White House were installed in two buildings from which peasants had been evicted. The corpses were cremated in pits and pyres on the periphery of the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp. It was on Himmler's orders that Auschwitz-Birkenau obtained four huge crematoria at the end of 1942, equipped with undressing rooms and gas chambers with imitation showers, where transports arriving at the camp were directed. Very few who entered that gate were ever to find a way out. Adolf Eichmann, a high-ranking SS official and head of the Special Section for Jewish Affairs in the main Reich Security Office, was responsible for organizing this genocide. He did it well. The regular transports of Jews first started arriving at a special platform at the Auschwitz goods station from where they were dispatched to the camp. In 1944, a siding was constructed immediately inside the Birkenau murder camp. Time was pressing, and there were so many Jews still in Europe. A transport is arriving. The locomotive whistled horribly. It puffed. The train rolled along the station. Pale, wrinkled, tired, rumpled, terrified faces of women and men who still had their hair, a rather exotic feature, looked through the barred windows. They passed slowly, observed the station in silence. Then something started to thump and rumble against the wooden wagon walls. Water! Air! The bolt snapped free. The wagons were opened. So wrote the author Tadeusz Borowski of the arrival of a transport to be gassed. Johann Paul Kramer, a professor of Münster University and an SS camp doctor in Auschwitz, described what he felt on the 2nd of September 1942. I was present for the first time at a special action at 3 a.m. Dante's hell was laughable when compared with that. Three days later, Kramer was the doctor responsible for selecting a transport from Holland. He wrote, 
SS men willingly participated in these actions due to the additional rations they received of one-fifth liter of vodka, five cigarettes, 100 grams of sausage and bread. Camp Commander Hurs thus described the role of the SS doctor at the ramp. The wagons were emptied one after the other. The Jews had to put aside their luggage and file past the SS doctor who decided whether they were fit to work, watching as they moved. Those able to work were led to the camp, an average of 25 to 30 percent, bearing all transports into account. Among Greek Jews, only 15 percent were able to work, however. Indeed, Dante's hell was nothing compared to this. wrote, the Jews who were to be annihilated were led to the crematoria as calmly as possible, men and women separately. After undressing, they entered the gas chamber, fitted with showers to give the impression of baths. The first to enter were women with children, then men, there were always less of them. The doors were quickly bolted shut, disinfectors waited nearby, and immediately threw tziklon through the ceiling openings. Nearly one-third died immediately, others began to panic, shriek, and try to breathe. After a few minutes, they were all prostrate. After 20 minutes, no one moved. The Zonder commando extracted gold teeth from the corpses. The women had their hair cut off. The ashes were carried by trucks to the Vistula River and there shoveled into the water. It sometimes happened that the gas chambers were full when a transport arrived. In such cases, the condemned had to wait until there was room for them to be murdered. The enormous majority of Jews suffered anonymous deaths in Auschwitz. No one asked them for their names. No one registered them or gave them numbers. There was no reason to do so. They were going to die the most quickly and no trace of them was to be left. Even so, it was stated on the basis of partially preserved documents and the testimony of witnesses that the poet Itzach Kanzenelson A brother of pre-war French Prime Minister René Blum was among the victims. As were Edith Stein, Professor Husserl's assistant and a Catholic nun, also the mother and sister of Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel. Thousands and hundreds of thousands were not even head counted. They were to die and that was the end of it. Their ashes were spread on the fields or swallowed by ponds and the Vistula River.
After the ashes were jettisoned, valuables and objects remained which could bring riches to the SS and vast benefits for the Reich Treasury. The victims were tricked prior to their last ever journey to life and work in the East, to take their tools and valuables with them. These landed up in the camp so-called Canada stores, presumably because Canada meant prosperity and affluence. There was so much looted property that several hundred prisoners in more than 30 barracks were employed full-time to deal with it. The clothing, footwear, watches and spectacles were for the people at home and the frontline soldiers. The gold and valuables were for the SS. Other materials went for reprocessing. Even the ashes of those cremated were used as a fertilizer. Having said that, the Canada stores were full to the end of the camp's existence and part of the deposits can be seen today in the Auschwitz Museum. This was established by the Polish government as a national institution which cared for what was left of the camp to be maintained for time immemorial. This is the museum as it looks today. There can surely be nothing more tragic than a girl's tress of hair that's been cut off, a curl wound with such detailed care. The Third Reich needed even these tresses for military production, robbery to the last strand of hair. Jews classified by the doctors as fit to work landed up in the camp, not to live and survive, but to die from superhuman effort in inhuman conditions, destruction through work. Such were the practical details of the final solution. In the meantime, however, Jews alongside non-Jews received their striped uniforms with identification tags and their prisoner numbers tattooed on their forearms. They lived in barracks, a whole city of barracks. Some 400,000 persons received camp numbers in the Gestapo register.
Despite the unbearable crowding in the overfull barracks, the people there, deprived of the most elementary intimate features of life, were taught, as if in mockery, off hats in barracks, a louse can kill you. There were many enemies, hunger, damp, cold, rain and snow, illness and epidemics, but none caused as many deaths as did the Nazis themselves. The Germans knew how to create instruments of torture, humiliation and degradation out of everything. The camp rules even limited the time a prisoner could spend visiting the latrine. Adolf Hitler, the Führer of the German nation, himself called the Jews and Gypsies human dregs. They were to fertilize the great German living space with their ashes. An order of the 29th of January 1943 had whole Gypsy families transported to Auschwitz where they were placed in Birkenau section B to E. The Gypsy camp register which survived the war held 21,000 names. They died of hunger, cold and illnesses. The less than 3,000 who survived were gassed on the 2nd of August, 1944. As though the ordinary camp rules were not enough, penal companies were established in August 1940. At the beginning, Jews and priests had priority in being allocated to them. Later, their ranks were supplemented by political prisoners and those suspected of preparing to escape or of belonging to the camp resistance movement. It was here that prisoners were to pay for their origins, beliefs and opinions. They were assigned to the most dangerous and exhausting jobs, land improvement, cleaning out ponds, road building. The penal company supervisors were the most bestial of the SS guards. An occasion to a penal company augured imminent death. A desperate escape attempt from the penal company took place on the 10th of June 1942. It mainly comprised Poles, for they were then in the majority in the company. Nine managed to escape. The remaining were executed by the Germans. Some blocks had a particularly gruesome history. For example, Block 25 in the women's camp in Birkenau. Women were sent there as a death sentence if they were sick, looked sick, or simply unable to work. 
They had to wait in this block until there was room for them in the gas chambers. During this time, they received neither food nor water. Block 11 in the main camp has gone down in Auschwitz history as the death block. It was the detention prison where death sentences passed in the camp were carried out. The Gestapo court in Silesia also passed verdicts here on prisoners brought in from Upper Silesia. The investigation proceedings here had almost always one and the same sentence. In the name of the German nation, death. The travesty of court trials lasted no longer than required to check the identification of the accused. That was all that was needed. Those sentenced there were shot on the spot. Sometimes they were shot in the washroom. However, usually they had to undress in the washroom and then were marched out to the yard. Several steps to the right, to the execution wall, the order and then the shot. A pretext for further oppression and torture was the daily roll call of the prisoners. Several times public executions by hanging took place during roll call. The poorly dressed, sometimes barefoot prisoners waited for hours in the wind and cold for escapees to be caught. Order was imperative. If someone had escaped, the SS would sometimes select 10 or 20 prisoners and sentence them to death by starvation. In one such case, a young prisoner selected to die in the starvation cell was exchanged for Father Maximilian Kolbe, a Polish Franciscan monk, who asked that his life be taken instead of that of his fellow man. The legend and memory of that event, of a person voluntarily going to his death, is an essential part of what happened in Auschwitz. Every day there also would have been small acts of human heroism and altruism among the prisoners. When Pope John Paul II visited Auschwitz in 1979, he drew attention to the fact that the people who practiced such acts included those of various beliefs and differing ideologies, surely not only believers. Three years later, he elevated Maximilian Kolbe to sainthood to mark the eternity of human dignity stronger even than death. One has to have a sense of dignity to write to one's near ones in the hour of death. I depart this world on the evening of July the 30th for the crematorium furnace sentenced to death like some bandit. 58 of us and 10 women are going there, conscious and innocent. Tell Lolunia that her daddy is no more. Be with God. My dear wife, today, the 31st of October, I am going innocently to be done away with. Never forget me, my wife, and bring up our darling daughter as a good person and in the love of God. The prison camp hospital neither cured nor protected from death. On the contrary, the SS camp doctors murdered the sick and the weak by giving them phenol injections directly into the heart. Untold thousands died that way. The doctors killed and experimented. The genetics of multiple pregnancies and handicaps were studied by Dr. Josef Mengele on living people. Professor Karl Klauberg, on a special order from Himmler, researched methods of rapid sterilization of women. His human guinea pigs were all Jewish women. Klauberg reported to Himmler that the day was not far off 
when one skilled doctor with ten assistants would be able to sterilize several hundred, even a thousand women in one day. Such were the so-called doctors of Auschwitz. It must not be forgotten that there was resistance in the camp as well as mutual aid and solidarity among prisoners. Witold Pilecki, an officer of the underground Polish Home Army, was an organizer of the camp resistance movement who appointed the way for socialists and social democrats from Germany, Austria and France, for communists from Poland, Germany and Russia. To mention just a few of the names, Ernst Burger, Hermann Langbein, Karl Lill, Bernard Świerczyna, Józef Serenkiewicz, Stanisław Kłodziński, Jerzy Tabo Wesołowski. Those who escaped from the camp were not only to save their lives, but also to spread the truth about Auschwitz. Such was the purpose of the escape of Paul Jerzy Tabo Wesołowski and the Slovak Jews Rudolf Vrba Rosenberg and Alfred Wetzler. Their reports about the camp were delivered to the Allies and published in Washington in 1944, but the world found the whole subject very hard to believe. The small remaining Polish population of Oświęcim and neighboring villages certainly knew what was going on in Auschwitz. Rudolf Hirsch reported in 1940 that the local population is fanatically Polish and, as intelligence sources claim, are ready to oppose the hated SS staff in any way. Indeed, many local Poles did get involved in transmitting documents from the camp and passing on information generally. Lists of those killed, for example, details of the camp population and the names of the killers. Three remarkable photographs showing the process of mass murder which were taken by Jewish prisoners were smuggled out of the camp and survived to tell their story. Polish resistance movement tried to get food into the camp, deliver medicine and offer encouragement through pamphlets and letters. If caught, there could only be one punishment. Among those who risked their lives and those of their families to help the prisoners were Janina Kajtoch, the Dusik couple, Anna Zdrowakowa, Maria Bobrzecka. Maria Stromberger, an Austrian and nurse in the SS hospital, declared herself on the side of the resistance. The reports from the camp permitted the Polish government in exile in London to attempt to present the truth as early as 1941, not only of Auschwitz, but of all the other Nazi camps and prisons, the truth of genocide. Allied air photographs taken in 1944 show the existence of the camps Auschwitz and Auschwitz-Birkenau. These photographs have recently been studied by historians and you can clearly see just how the camp was used.
In the second half of 1944, the Polish Home Army sent a paratrooper from Britain to the camp resistance movement. He was Lieutenant Stefan Jaszczynski, pseudonym Urban, who was to check whether an armed uprising in the camp was feasible. His end was tragic. Caught and held in the cellars of the death block, he was killed a few days before liberation. Great is the power of human dignity and man's belief in justice, historical justice. It was primarily with a mind to future generations and history that the Jews from the special crematorium disposal squads, because they knew what fate awaited them, wrote notes and hid them to be found after the war in the ruins of the crematoria. They held descriptions not only of the martyrdom of their people, but also of how those prisoners forced to cremate the bodies of their brothers and sisters had prepared for a unique and desperate uprising. It broke out in October 1944. The Germans took terrible revenge on them for destroying crematorium number four. Jankel Handelsmann died during a horrifying interrogation. Rosa Robota and three other Jewesses were killed for supplying the explosives stolen from Unionwerke to the uprising. But they had fought. The last marching death columns left Auschwitz in January 1945. The Nazis were evacuating the workforce and witnesses to their crimes. When he assumed power, Hitler had announced triumphantly, what we have succeeded in doing is to give the German nation a new idea. What he brought, in fact, was death and destruction to countless millions of men, women and children. Red Army's offensive in January 1945 brought freedom to the surviving remnants of the slaughter. exactly how many were murdered in Auschwitz. The number of human beings who were put to death here is so large that the meaning of such a figure, even if it could be given, would be difficult to comprehend. Numbers alone cannot convey the horror and tragedy of the events at Auschwitz. Each individual who died there represented the loss to the world of a unique human personality. This film is dedicated to the memory of each and every one of them. <laughs>